Blog Talk Radio. My name is Debbie Dahmer. I am the producer and host of Voices Carry for Animals, and I want to uh, welcome everybody aboard. All you new listeners, hope you enjoy the show. Keep coming back and spreading the word. All you returning listeners, thank you so much for all your support because uh, these animals need our voices and they need them now, each and uh, from all angles. So please do your part. And, you know, take action is the key. Um, I just want to go over a couple things. That was Lonnie, um, and his song L Train at the beginning. We're rocking the airways again tonight. And, uh, you know, for the animals, rocking legislation. So please get it in there. Ask a uh, request for a constituent bill proposal form from your state representatives. Uh, fill it out. And then you can either fax an email back or mail it back. And whatever issues you have, because us, you know, we the people are constituent citizens, so we can't get involved. And they'll uh, after they get it, they'll send it to draft, come back. Uh, if they approve it, it'll get it filed, and then go through the proper steps of the House of Representatives to be approved, the senators, and then the governor to sign so all of us can make a difference. We just got to at least try. Um, I just want to go over a couple of things before we get started tonight. Um, the P, uh, this, li- this show is coming live from the PPJ Gazette online. Everyone to check it out. There's articles on humans, health, animals, uh, some hot topics Marty Oakley has got. I want to give her a big shout out for all she does and all her TS Radio Network. I was on that uh, 163 shows with her. I was the host, and then I came on my own, and we're still in touch, and we're a great team, and that's what it takes. So thank you, Marty Oakley, and keep up the great work you're doing. You're a great voice out there, and you've made me a big monster uh, radio advocate. So everyone just, uh, you know, do your part. That's all it takes, because once we all come together as one and and take action, that's the key. So um, if you want to, there is a petition, and we're going to be discussing that on this show with Anthony Marr. He don't want to welcome him aboard. And um, please, you know, sign it, pass it along, because our subject's going to be about the wild horses and slaughter roundups and, you know, whatever we can do to help these horses, because they cannot fight back. They can't defend themselves. And there's a lot going on. So I'm going to go ahead and bring him on. And he is, uh, Anthony Marr, is the founder of FreedomHorse.org. Okay. And he also is the founder of Heal Our Planet Earth Hope. And please check those websites out. We'll be giving those uh, later in the show. I'm going to be taking calls at uh, about around 720 for um, Anthony, and then I'm going to turn around and give him a 10 till 8 p.m. Eastern time. So um, if you have any questions or comments, here's the phone number. I have it the same every week. Is area code 310-982-4270. Press 1. Uh, you would be in a queue and let me know that you want to speak. Just try to refrain from any noises in the background, TVs, radios, conversations, and you're more than welcome to come on board. 
Um, I want to go ahead and bring Anthony on. Um, he's got also got a petition, everybody. Like I said before, please sign and share it. Um, but I want to welcome him. Anthony, how are you this evening? Welcome aboard oh, the Voices well. Care for Animals. I'm so excited to have another show tonight. I love standing up for all the animals in need, you know, and try to help out as much as I can. But you want to go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself and how you got started. Because you're, I checked out your website, Anthony, on the both of them. And you are amazing, what are everything that you're doing out there. And I'd like to have you come back on again for the different issues you stand up for. Because you are a, you, you're, you're a fighter out there, I'll tell you. And thank you for that. But go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started. Go right ahead. You're live oh, and on the air. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Debbie. It's, uh, I've been uh, expecting to uh, be on this show for a long, long time, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've got this people going on. It's, it'll, it'll get off in a couple of seconds. But anyway, um, I am, I've lived a long life already, 75, and uh, I, I started my full-time, uh, my full-time activism at my age of 51. So uh, don't anybody who is young say, oh, well, it's too late for me to get started. <laughs> 51 <laughs> to 35 is, you know, it's about, you know, almost 30 years. So it's full-time and uh, mostly volunteer work, full-time volunteer work. And uh, I started with uh, getting rid of all the endangered species parts in Chinatown. And then I went to India to uh, try to save the Bengal tiger where they live, that over three years uh Three year period between 1996 to about 1999, and then I started my own campaign uh, under the flag of uh, Heal Up Planet Earth. And then um, I've taken quite a few, taken on quite a few species. Uh, I'm known as a wildlife preservationist, and the Bengal tiger is the number one uh, species that I work for. And then uh, other species include the Canadian harp seal, uh, grizzly bears, uh, Japanese bottlenose dolphins, and um, uh, whales uh, and so on, and uh, and I've done a lot of uh, um, long distance driving, speaking tours. Uh, eight of them, in fact, uh, each one covering about thirty to forty states uh, in forty-seven years or so, every single time. And that would be in the two thousand years. I also uh, conceived of a of a system of philosophy called the Omni Scientific Cosmology, which is a cosmology which is built upon not just the physical sciences, as in physics and astronomy, but also uh, life sciences like biology and ecology and even psychology. And uh, that uh, is indeed the theory of everything. <laughs> you have to look okay. uh, look at my number one book called Omniscience. And then uh, at the same time, I also uh, tr- uh, did a campaign to stop sh- uh, shark fin sales in the Vancouver, Richmond area. And... Uh, among other things, so I usually keep myself busy. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds so now it's the wild like horses. Uh, wow. Well, the wild Impressive. horses are important to me because uh, my family name in Chinese is horse, and uh, and I live up to my name, uh, or try to. And I began to to uh, dabble in wild horse issues as of the mid uh, two thousand years, uh, two thousand and seven. I spoke on it at the Animal Rights uh, Conference, wearing a T-shirt uh, with a rearing horse saying, forever free. It is my profile picture on Facebook. And uh, and uh, so my prime purpose at my age of 75 right now is to, um, or latest pur- uh, purpose anyway, is to uh, save the wild horses from mass slaughter, which is currently the topic. Uh, currently, the uh, Congress and uh, the BLM have come to an agreement saying, okay, uh, we're going to extend our no-kill policy. Uh, but then there was really no real solution. It's just k- kicking the can farther down the road, and every single time they kick the can, it gets heavier, and it hurts your toes even more. Sooner or later, it's going to hit a wall. And, uh, and, but, uh, you know, but Congress has to answer to the constituents, and 80% of uh, of people polled do not want to see wild horses slaughtered, and that's the vast majority. So uh, Congress has to toe that line, and the BLM is uh, 
uh, has a certain way of doing things, I should say, which uh, is, in my opinion, obsolete, and they should totally revamp the way that they look at this problem, which is uh, the, the 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 solution that I'm advancing uh, currently with my uh, petition. Uh, anybody interested in signing the petition, uh, giving you the link on the radio is hard, but uh, you can just Google Anthony Marr, that's M-A-R-R, uh, wild horse, and you'll see the petition right up top uh, on Google. And uh, so the purpose of this uh, this interview, in from my point of view, is to um, uh, present this solution in as plain uh, a term as possible, so that anybody who is not familiar with the situation up to this point can understand it. Can understand first of all why there is a a problem, in fact, an unprecedented problem. Uh, uh, which requires an unprecedented solution, which I don't think that the BLM has, and uh, which I am venturing to advance to, for public approval uh, in the court of public opinion. And uh, hopefully there is a, a um, an overwhelming support uh, for such a solution or something similar to it, so that uh, there is um, no, no other thing that BLM can do uh, than to adopt it. Uh, otherwise, the other solution would be to vastly slaughter them. So that uh, that is my purpose, to spend this hour of my life <laughs> right now on the air. So uh, to uh, give, you, give you a quick uh, um, run through as to what the problem is, it is I can, I can analogize it pretty quickly by saying, okay, um, maybe I should start the, the flow way, which is the beginning. So First of all, I want to ascertain my position, which is the wild horse is native to the public land and the cows are an invasive species. And it is very easy to to support if you use paleontology as well as um, evolutionary biology. We, we know that the horse species, Equus, began in North America, not in Asia, not in Europe, but in North America, in those states as today's Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, these areas. And uh, that would be, it came into being about, ten, about 5 million years ago. Before then, it was the Hippus family, which is uh, the, uh, pre, the pre-Equus horses, uh, which are pretty small and dog-like, dog size and so on. But uh, eventually, Equus came to the fore at 5 million years ago, and then uh, a bunch of them went over to Asia and uh, their own breeds, including the Spanish barb, eventually. Uh, the native breed continued in North America until just very recently, geologically speaking, only about like 14,000 years ago or so uh, when the last ice age ended and the megafauna was decimated by, presumably by the uh, newly arrived humans from Asia. And uh, that included the wild horses. So by about 10,000 years ago, the wild horses in North America were wiped out, uh, presumably by humans uh, and also by climate change, obviously. And then, uh, but the, uh, those branches that developed in Asia and, U- and Europe didn't die off. And uh, eventually, by, uh, by means of Mr. Columbus uh, and his um, uh, followers, eventually uh, they brought the Spanish barb back over to America, which means it brings them home. So the, uh, there was a very tiny t- uh, geological time gap of about 10,000 years without, without horses in North America, and uh, and then the Spanish uh, brought the Spanish barb over, and then uh, some of them escaped as feral horses, and then uh, eventually they became adopted to back to their original environment and became the truly wild horse. Uh, it is unfair to the Mustang to be called a feral horse. The feral, the term feral, feral applies during the process of their escapement into back into the natural environment, and after they have readapted it, they would have returned to the status of wild horse. And uh, that is just my own view of things. Uh, the, the people might disagree, and that's okay. And then, so, um, after they have come back over, their number multiplied because they're under human protection, but some of them uh, either escaped or were deliberately set free. Uh, and then uh, that would be about the 1600s, 1700s. And then uh, the... Um, at that point, the population were kind of kept in check by the natural predators, which eventually were wiped out. 
by the mostly by the uh, Europeans, and uh, where it is relevant, which means the public uh, uh, lands, the uh, natural predators were pretty much neutralized in terms of the geological impact on the horses. Uh, for example, the cougars uh, and the horses' ha habitat do not really overlap all that well, even though cougars um, fall uh, under normal conditions, but the normal conditions are long gone. Uh, the humans are running the show, and uh, the uh, cougars, therefore, have been pushed back, and the, and the cougar and horse habitats don't overlap all that well. Uh, the natural science, uh, the natural, I'm, I'm sorry, the na the National Academy of Sciences, NAS, uh, did a study and they found that uh, uh, there was almost no evidence of wolf predation on horses at all. So uh, between the time of Columbus and today, the uh, humans, uh, either the natives and or the Europeans, uh, have decimated the um, predator populations in where the uh, wild horses concentrate that is the today's today's uh, 11 state 11 wild horse states in the uh, mountain regions and desert regions and uh, so before the uh, decimation of the predators the horse the uh, wild horse population were kept in check and then uh, they eventually the um, the ranchers arrived and hunters into the ranch, uh, so-called ranch lands uh, on, the, uh, on the range of the public lands. Uh, they, uh, but for their own reasons, uh, pretty much wiped out all the predators, and therefore there was no control of the horse population in the wild uh, until they found their own limit, which is what the uh, environment can sustain. And if they pushed that limit, they would damage the environment and they would loss of staff themselves. And that's the way uh, horses under no control by natural predators nor human control will end up as, and that would be population regulation by uh, starvation and environmental damage. And once the, the environment is, is damaged in, in those delicate, delicate semi-desert environments, um, it would take a long time to recover. And of course, the horses uh, or you know, and or other uh, species that over-exploited would would damage it, and uh, the recovery time would be too long, and therefore the carrying capacity of the land would decrease, and then uh, the uh, horses will, will uh, uh, when when pushing the limit, would die sooner for, uh, in 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 later years. Um, so then, uh, because the natural predators have been pretty much wiped out, uh, the wild horse population did grow. And then the humans, the uh, Europeans particularly, introduced the cattle into the mix. And uh, and then it becomes a contention between cattle and wild horses. And since cattle is a cash animal crop and the wild horses are not, then, the, then of course the authorities would favor the cattle over the horse. The horse becomes something kind of symbolic but not of any, any uh, monetary value. And so the... Um, the humans begin to have to come in to play, uh, and then uh, they would uh, take sides with the cattle, and it ended up with humans having to round up the wild horses rather brutally by means of helicopters, and then uh, and then find a solution for what happens to the captive horses and also what happens to the horses on the range. And in the meantime, the cat, the cattle, of course, is protected by humans, and the humans become the sort sort of surrogate predators to keep the ho the horses population in check and um so fast forward to uh the year two thousand or so and onward um the the horses population have been sort of um cut down to approximately twenty five twenty six thousand and uh which is a low number given the uh, the uh, the number that uh, the environment can support uh, without the cows. And uh, so to make a long story short, what currently uh, the situation looks like is that um, the horses are sort of increasing in, pop in, in pop population roughly at the rate of about 10 to 15% per year as borne out by 
statistics over the years and supported by the uh, Natural Academy of Sciences, which is a bastion of factual truth, in my opinion. And uh, so the NAS's number is about 10 to 15% uh, per year, depending on the, on the ongoing population, as well as the carrying capacity of the land and the quality of the land in terms of forage and all that. And um, so, but there was no law to protect these horses uh, before 1970. And uh, so, you know, you may have seen uh, old movies like The Misfits by Marilyn Monroe and Carl Clayton Cable and Mon Montgomery Clift about uh, these mustangers who, who can just at will go and capture them and do whatever they want with them. And uh, so after a while, the government sort of uh, put together an act called the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, which uh, is a kind of a protection uh, for the wild horses and burrows. Uh, and henceforth, when I talk about wild burrows, it will include the burrows, and, uh, but burrows are in much smaller numbers than wild horses. And um, uh, where was I? So, um, yeah, they, uh, they put the, BM, the BLM in charge. Now, the BLM, the, the, the Bureau of uh, Land Management, uh, was not in existence in the 1920s or something. And uh, its previous incarnation is the U.S. Grazing Service. So, once, so, so immediately, the, the, the sort of innate inclination is it's obvious that they are in favor of the cattle. And... Uh, Back in about 1971, when that act was, was finally passed, they concluded that there were about 26,000 wild horses on the range. And uh, they set the population limit uh, uh, in the terms in the term of the AML, which is the um, management uh, level, the appropriate management level, which basically is uh, derived from the AUM, which is the animal unit month. Uh, basically, which is, you know, a cow, for example, they say 1,000 uh, pound, 1,000 pound cow uh, is equal to one animal unit. So, uh, so, which means for, to keep this animal alive just by grazing on the land for one month, uh, that would be so many acres required, and so on. So, uh, if a, if it's a lighter cow, it would be say if it's a 600 pound cow, it would be 0.6 AU. If it's a 1.2 uh, thousand pound cow, it'll be AU 1.2. And uh, and the uh, number of acres per cow per month is calculated uh, according to whatever cr criteria they use. That the National uh, Academy of Sciences are not too impressed by. So. Um, so they set a limit for 26,600 uh, when the current population at that point of the horses is, tw is 26,000, which is kind of suspicious, uh, the proximity of these two numbers. Uh, but very convenient because, you know, they they set a limit right where the horses' population is so that um, uh, any horses that exceed that will, will, will um, be probably eliminated in some way. But uh, in 1971, uh, when that act was passed, uh, it includes a no-kill clause in principle, which is, you know, okay, we're, we're going to keep the horses down uh, uh, at the limit, which is 26,600, and uh, anything over that, we will gather them, so, so-called, and then just uh, put them into holding or get people to adapt them, adopt them, and so on now. Uh, that's a nice scheme as long as it worked, but it didn't work for too long. Uh, when it first came into being, people were quite enthused about the Mustang, and and the uh, drive to uh, uh, adopt them was pretty high. But eventually, people simmered down to about uh, only about seven percent of all the captive horses were adopted. So basically, they would gather maybe fifteen percent of the horses, and only about seven percent would be adopted. And uh, so eventually they would, the the horses being, the horses not adopted, but held in captivity, um, keeps on increasing. 
and there was only a limit to which these uh, these horses can be can accumulate in these holding facilities, which is very expensive to run. And uh, so, once again, making a long story short, every single year when 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 they would uh, collect a number of horses and dump into these holding facilities, they can make good this no kill policy because you know whatever they catch, they just dump into these these holding facilities either long term or or short term. And um so but there's a limit to it of course, uh up to about two thousand and seventeen, the short term, very expensive holding facilities, which usually looks takes the form of of corrals. Um uh, the total capacity would be there were there are maybe twenty or thirty of these facilities and they total approximately forty five thousand horses that they can hold. And uh the BLM also grabbed a uh or or, or contracted a whole bunch of um pastures in surrounding states like Oklahoma and Nebraska and all that and they put uh, uh a lot of the captive forces into them as long term holding facilities and they're cheaper to run. And so uh the and their capacity would be maximum about thirty thousand, maybe less. So totally about seventy thousand horses, uh I mean uh vacancies. And uh come two thousand and eighteen, which is only last year, uh finally the can hit the wall because all the holding facilities are full, are practically full. So what do you do with the you know with the excess horses on the range that you that you want to pile uh, uh back into these holding facilities there's no room for them so there is only one place where they can go and that is according to the conventional thinking that is the the uh, slaughterhouse and in the meantime the population on the range also increases uh say let's say in 2014 the official uh, population of the horses on the range is about 35,000. Uh, come 2018, it was up to 82,000. Now, 82,000 minus 26,6, which is the limit, is you know easily 60,000 uh, horses or 55,000 horses, and and uh, their population expands at about 10 to 15 percent, and therefore they um, their uh, population would get even higher this year in 2019 and next year 2020 I would say that that you know by the formula of 10 to 15 percent increase a year without control uh, uh, with only roundup and 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 capture as a control uh, they would uh, uh, you know it, it so it would get larger and larger uh, you know, in two thousand, in the year twenty twenty, there would be probably closer to maybe a hundred thousand horses on the range, and when the when the limit set by the bare land is twenty six six. So, what do we do also with these seventy thousand horses on the range that the bare land by policy will be rounding up? So there were, we've got seventy somewhat excess horses on the range, and about seventy thousand, uh, both the seventy thousand or so uh, in captivity. You added up. To about 150,000 horses, uh, uh, to to the BLM only 26.6 is allowed. So you know what do you do with all these horses? Another thing is with these holding facilities, it is very expensive, particularly the short-term holding facilities, uh, the corral type, and uh, to the point when the annual budget of the BLM uh, of about uh, 80,000. I mean, I'm sorry, eighty million dollars, eighty million dollars per year BLM budget. I would say over seventy-five percent to ninety percent were used up in using helicopters to gather these horses very brutally, uh, often causing uh, 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 you know um, wounds and uh, and the damages and so on and so forth, as well as trauma, and uh, and. With a big problem, you know what do we do with these horses? And uh, so right now they're stuck at this point, and the uh, and the general public and thanks to you everybody who's listening listening in uh, for opposing uh, slaughter, the the uh, Congress and the BLM both have to agree that that you know that they are uh, still not killing these horses even though they've got no solution. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> 
and uh, and the current uh, and administration under President Trump is, is very pro killing of the horses. He uh, he was pressing for killing them in 2018, and when Congress refused to do that, uh, he kept quiet for a little while. And, not, and now the, he's pushing again. His his admin is pushing again for the for for slaughter. So the horses are constantly in danger. They're not out of danger whatsoever. So we need a solution to be able to take care of this problem. So I think I've uh, kind of uh, outlined what the problem is. So if there's anybody who has any any questions about the about the problem before going to the solution, I'd like to to answer a couple of them first. Right. If anybody has any questions or comments for Anthony on the, um, the problem here, please call in at uh, area code three one zero nine eight two. Uh, four two seven uh, zero. Press one. You'll be in the queue, and I'll, I'll just try to refrain from any noises in the background, conversations, TVs, radios, and you're more than welcome to come aboard. Uh, all these shows are uh, came in late, are recorded live every Thursday at seven o'clock Eastern, and archived on Blog Talk Radio. So if you just go to Blog Talk Radio and search uh, "Voices Care for Animals." or Animal Advocates Radio, you can go right to it, or I got it on the Animal Advocates Radio, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Voices Carry for Animals. And all the links are there, just press which one, and uh, wait a minute to download, and it will play. You can uh, listen and share 24-7 uh, from the left side of the screen of the uh, promo and to every almost every social media site out there, everyone we are the voices of these animals, and we must be heard. So they need our help, and in each other the way, we're all animals and humans are all this temporarily, and we got to make the best of it. And Anthony, there's one thing I see on uh, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest. The amount of uh, member activity is way down. You know, people taking action and, you know, letting them know and putting it in the news feed. And that's sad because if this is happening, this is why it's taking so long. You know, I see all these different groups and pages, you know, to say um, for the horses or the, the dogs or the cats what they need to do, just work together, cross over, so it don't take so long. Because we're in the 2019, and we still have a lot of critical issues, you know. And it doesn't happen overnight, but at least if the more voices that come in and action takers, you know, the better off these animals are. Because we'll be, if, if it's going like this now, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, we'll still be sitting on this radio talking about it, you know. So... Everyone, please do your part. And, you know, I don't know why I heard a lot of people went to Instagram and, you know, but Twitter's, I noticed Twitter's way down and Facebook had its better days. You know, a lot of great activists have left there. You know, a lot of uh, members have been getting hacked and suspended. And it, it's sad, you know, it's a fight all the way around that we got here. And these horses and all these other animals need us now, not five, ten years from now. You know, so everyone, you know, do your part. Help, you know, sign this petition. And, Anthony, you want to go ahead and give your website out. And even give out your heal our planet Earth. Because the Earth is also important that we have to pay attention to. And thank you for all you're doing for that. Because, you know, that, I mean, our Earth is where we are living on. You know, so that's so important. But go right ahead. That's right. Yeah, there was no plan yes. B, that's for sure. We have, yeah, we can form plan Bs on Earth, but, uh, you know, there's no, no other plan we can go to. So so this is it. Now, um, let me start off with giving a solution by by saying yes, a couple of right words ahead. about welfare welfare ranching. I don't know if it's, a, you know, it, it, it is a pretty well-known term, but I don't, I don't know how many people actually knows what that means. Um, basically, it is to the tune of approximately five hundred million dollars a year. This welfare of of uh, of uh, of the uh, cattle ranching business uh, is being supported by the government um, by means of a gift. And how does this work? It works like this: it is not 
you know, okay, there are a large number, maybe 800,000 uh, meat producers in the USA. And, uh, but uh, only 20, maybe 2.7% of them are big enough to, to have, to, you know, to, to be able to drive the cow, you know, all the way into the BLM. Uh, public land to graze for a few months a year and then collect them, you know. And uh, those are the big ones. And it is those that get this benefit. And this benefit, uh, and even so, you know, even uh, 2.7% uh, of 800,000 uh, meat producers, a pretty large number, uh, maybe over 20,000 of them. And uh, they're all, sometimes as big as the Coke Brothers or Walmart or whatever, something of that range. But uh, they... They are the ones that benefit uh, from this five hundred million dollars. Some say almost up to one billion dollars of government gift uh, to them, and that is in essence a welfare uh, payment to them. And it's not in the form of a check. If it is in the form of a check, and you average them out over twenty thousand people, it would be about thirty-three thousand uh, thirty-three thousand dollars per uh, cattle grazer um, on BLM land. And how is this paid? It is paid by by the taxpayer paying for the actual cost of the of the cattle being grazed on public land, and uh, and um, how much they charged. And they charge a ridiculous amount. If it's a private pasture or private grazing land, uh, uh, ranchers uh, using those private lands were to pay twenty one dollars and sixty cents per month per per head. And guess how much the uh, bear lamb is charging the ranchers. On public land, one dollar thirty-five cents per month per head. So one point that's that's about the size of a kind of dog food, okay? <laughs> and uh, these people can just put a cow under this range for that for that amount. When actually, it, what it causes tax uh, tax taxpayers dollars is over twenty dollars, and and uh, these. Uh, cattle barons are, you know, who, a lot of them are million dollars, uh, I mean, millionaires and billionaires, and they are uh, given th- this kind of a gift uh, of $33,000 per on average, and of course, when not average, some of them get a lot more, and uh, and um, so what it means is that the taxpayer pays for the, for the uh, cost of grazing so much cattle, of so much of their cattle on this land, and the government gets back a small pittance from them. And this, even so, this small pittance doesn't go back into government financial economic circulation, but it is, it is um, spent back onto the land to build more fences and so on, which is to, to, to fortify an, a business that this uh, welfare um, uh, system creates. And, and, um, and uh, now... The current uh, ratio between number of cows and number of horses on government land is approximately 23 cows to one horse. Including barrels would be 28 cows to one horse barrel. And uh, sometimes it goes up to about 63 to one. Now, who determines this ratio, this hugely uh, unequal uh, ratio of you know thirty or forty cows per horse on a land that legitimately, in my opinion, belongs to the horse. It's being native, and the uh, and the cow being uh, actually the ancestor of the current um, cattle in North America uh, originated in Asia and Europe, not in North America. So the horse originated in North America. So you tell me who is the native uh, species. Some still argue, okay, well, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's not the same horses anymore. Yes, it is. It's the same species. And um, uh, let's say uh, if uh, you know if 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 somebody drives out all the deer from a from a piece of land and uh, and you know makes a, uh, a corn pl- plantation out of it, and the deer is gone for a few years and then they come back and uh, and the munch on the corn. Uh, are they invasive or not? They would be called an invasive species, whereas we humans are, and we drove them out. So, so we've got to be a little bit fair about the whole thing instead of just, you know, might is right. And uh, so uh, the ranchers really don't want to, to let go, but, but who sets this ratio of 30 to 1, 40 to 1, 50 to 1? 
It is just the beer that I'm doing it. It is arbitrary. And uh, so, so what, what, what I would suggest, number one, is that we decrease this ratio a little bit uh, just to play their game, to beat them in the game. So, 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 you know, what I'm saying is I'm asking the BLM and I'll be speaking like this. I'll be, I'll be speaking as if I'm the BLM and I would say if I were the BLM, I would do this. And if I were the BLM, I would do this. I would, I would dec- currently the number of uh, cows on the uh, public land range is about almost 2 million. It's 1.9 million. The number of horses is less than 100,000. Okay, so it's ridiculous. If you want any any equity whatsoever, this is this is totally unjust, unfair, and almost illegal. So um, I would ask BLM to use the arbitrary power to cut it back by about ten percent. So so if there is 1.9 million cows, you cut it back, you cut 190 thousand. You reduce the number of cows on range by 190 thousand or 200 thousand. And that would be constitute about a 10% decrease of the cow population, not too much, of a, of a, of a, of a wound to that industry. Whereas if we, if we do that, we would be able to lift the uh, maximum ALM, I mean AML, the maximum uh, appropriate uh, management level, which means the number of ca- horses allowed to live on the total of 229 million acres, uh, up from 26 to almost 200,000. And that is, that is legitimate for the horse if the BLM pulls the cows out of it because the horse can just fill in that vacuum left by the cows without any additional feeding at all. But if, if we need additional feeding or supplementary feeding for the horses, we can always pull what they would have been fed in the holding facilities if they were still kept there. So it is no extra expense whatsoever. But since the limit has been lifted up from tw- from 26.6 up to almost 200,000, we can release all the captive horses back onto the land and keep the number of horses on the land, say 100,000 plus 170,000 from the uh, from the holding facilities, totaling 170,000 horses back onto the land completely without even touching that limit of 190,000. So that would be an increase of about eight times the number of horses allowed on the land and only a reduction of 10% of the cows. Now, don't you think that's a fair exchange? And if the ranchers still opposed to it, they're bloody greedy, as illustrated by Mr. Bundy. So... Um, that's the number one thing that I would suggest that the BLM to do is to withdraw 100 to 200,000 200, heads of cattle off the BLM and, and giving the land back to the horse by the same amount. And after that, now, when, you, when we re- release the captive horses from the holding facilities back onto the range, there's something that, that is very um, efficacious that we can do. Um, I'm going to be talking about birth control of the horses now because uh, it is a necessity. It is not not an experiment. It is a necessity, and it is a proven method on many species around the world, including elephants and rhinos and white-tailed deer and horses themselves on the East Coast. Um, uh, they've been using um, uh, birth control of the horses on the East Coast for many, many years. They've never had to remove any of them, and they are healthy. So the horses, obviously, if they, even if they start, have some room to move in, uh, that is under the ceiling of, say, 200,000 uh, maximum, uh, we have time and, and room to move to practice birth control on them to keep them under the limit, and which wouldn't be hard because it would be just maintenance contraception, uh, which would be to to, say, reduce the natural birth rate by about 10% every year. That would be easily attainable as long as you've got, got enough vaccines and enough people to administer them. Um, the problem with uh, administering vaccines, uh, say, PZP, in the field is that um, it is hard to administer. It is hard to uh, 
locate the horses. It is uncertain how to dot them. And after we have dotted the right, right number of horses, uh, that initial shot needs to be backed up by a, uh, a booster shot. After 30 days, you would go out there, go out there again, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know look for those horses again and re-identify them as those that have been uh, vaccinated and and get a booster shot shot in by dot again. And that is very hard to do, uh, labor-intensive, time-consuming, time and expensive. Now, we have a good solution, and that is um, the those horses that were kept in captivity, the uh, 70,000 of them, a lot of them have been neutered. So it's been done. So when we, uh, and, uh, you know, if that's, that's not enough, uh, and uh, if the calculation says, uh, and I would, I would insist that the National um, Acad Academy of Science um, Sciences okay them, uh, I would um, uh, I would say uh, using maintenance con contraception it would be very uh, cheap and uh, but it is nonetheless expensive because we have to do so many mini horses and now here comes the clincher of this solution and that is attractive even to the BLM and then I said if we release all the horses from the uh, holding facilities, leaving only those holding facilities that are still open that do uh, wild horse adoption. Um, all the holding facilities would, would be empty and they can be closed. And if you close them, you can... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you close them, you, okay. can, you can release about 60 to $70 million. 60 to $70 million from the $80 million annual budget of the BLM for them to refocus on the range and do on-range work instead of running those holding facilities. So even though they may suffer a little bit of, a, of an in, initial loss to reduce the number of um, uh, um, uh, total number of uh, cows on the range by 20 by 200,000, and that would be about one, uh, $1. $1.5 million uh, of loss, and they can easily easily eliminate that by increasing the uh, grazing fee by 10%, and, that would, and, uh, and uh, that would be the same financially, except there would be uh, 200,000 horses uh, less on the range. Um, so that would be the future situation. And... Uh, and in the meantime, since the horses are below limit, they they don't need to be uh, drastically birth controlled. So it's just uh, just a mild maintenance birth control. But if the uh, if the BLM refuses to uh, to pull two hundred thousand horses and just pull one hundred thousand or maybe only fifty thousand, um, we can easily do that. Still, this this can still work by intensifying the um, uh, birth control. Uh, system from maintenance contraception to reduction contraception, which is a little bit more intense, and uh, maybe by 20% instead of 10%. And uh, we can gradually diminish the total number of horses. Let's say if the BRM says, okay, 200,000 is too much, let's say 100,000, we can, 100,000 is still four times as, as, as high as the current 26,000. So so you know we 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 can bring it down to to uh to a hundred thousand and then return to the maintenance uh contraception um system so uh that's so then the horses would have a place of their own uh they will not have to be uh rounded up and they certainly do not have to be slaughtered uh they um uh and um given the amount of uh money that the p l m will have to work with uh, without having to spend, say, 60 70%, 80% of the money on these holding facilities. They can easily put together enough people and, uh, and enough vaccines to be able to handle the system from, uh, from, from release to uh, maintenance or reduction contraception to a, ste to a steady state of horse population just below the limit and uh, and then uh, no need to capture them, no need to harass them at all. Um, and um, the whole thing is humane because um, contraception as a process is humane. 
And uh, there are other people who say, okay, well, you know, we can just use um, neutering the males. Well, neutering males do not work because if you you can't neuter every single male, and if you do, first of all, you you get a whole species to be extinct, and secondly, uh, whichever male horse uh, that escaped this procedure will in, will impregnate all the all the males, and it uh, doesn't really help uh, the buying purpose. So it has to be females. Unfortunately, there's nothing sexist about it. Uh, with uh, with with white tail deer, it's the same. And um, and uh, it is easy to control because all you do is to let's say if there's a hundred mare uh, uh, mare of breeding age within a herd, then uh, you just uh, you know just immunize fifteen twenty, and um, uh, that procedure is reversible and it is um, and uh, you know people are opposed to it because sometimes it has some side effects in some cases, and uh, it is uh, either that. For example, they were saying that one foal uh, born with um, imperfections was, was uh, due to the PZPP, but in fact that, that foal was previous to that identified as being um, uh, malformed because it's inbreeding. So, um, so all in all, I want to throw this idea out to the public to discuss, and if it makes sense to them, and it's, if it makes sense to you, uh, that you please come in and sign the petition uh, just go to Google, look for my name, Anthony Marr, M-A-R-R, and then uh, add in Wild Horse, and you'll see the petition. Go in there and sign it. Uh, it is addressed to Congresswoman uh, Dina Titus of um, of Nevada, who is a very uh, outspoken uh, critic of the current um, uh, way of managing these so-called managing these uh, these wild horses. She's very vocal about it, and uh, and uh, this petition is addressed to uh, to Congress, Congresswoman Titus to uh, to uh, share the idea with her so that if, if it uh, makes sense to her that she would um, make it into a bill and uh, be voted on in Congress and then the Congress can tell the uh, BLM what to do. So uh, the uh, BLM, unfortunately, is not uh, under Congress but under uh, President Trump. Uh, because it is a part of the department Department of the Interior, and uh, and 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 Trump can just tell the DOI, you know, kill the horses, and the DOI would tell BLM kill the horses, and uh, it will be a done deal, unless Congress opposes that, and, and unless uh, Congress also offers a workable solution. Because even if the Congress uh, strikes a deal with the uh, BLM. As to no kill, it is not going to last forever because uh, kicking the boy, the the can't father down the road is once again unworkable, as you know, and uh, and the can gets heavier every time, and next time it hits the wall, it's going to be even worse. So uh, we've got to solve this problem immediately. Uh, Seventy, eighty thousand horses are at risk of being slaughtered. Uh, the BLM have thought about this solution actually uh, of. Um, Retiring all the holding facilities because they, as part well of Congress, see them as being uh, see these holding facilities as being uh, non-productive. It's just a, you know just like a band-aid. And but the BLM doesn't go doesn't think after that that uh, that that initial po- uh, thinking of closing the uh, holding facilities and getting the money out. Uh, but they immediately made a right hand turn. And uh, say, okay, we're going to close these holding facilities, and we are going to get these horses in the holding facilities all slaughtered. That's the way they think. The way we think is that we close these holding facilities and let the horses back onto the land, reduce the number of cows on the land, and let these horses live in peace in its own piece of land. And they're being already being over generous because they used to live in the entire. Uh, a public land area uh, through millions of years without restriction, and now it's restricted here and there, and you know, and uh, you know, so many horses per so many cows, and all that, and cows obviously are always winning. So um, that leaves only us to be able to make a difference. And uh, first of all, the BLM has to get the idea. Hopefully, Congresswoman Titus will give them the idea, or maybe given no choice but to abide by the idea and. And uh, and adopt a solution like this. It doesn't have to be exactly like what I'm proposing, but something similar in essence. And um, 
And uh, so we've got to get the BLM somehow to change its policy, uh, work it out with the Congress to change the policy into uh, taking back some cows and giving the horses back a little bit, and then the problem will be all solved. All solved. No more uh, roundup, no more slaughter, no more harassment. The horses will be able to live in peace. And if they have any premonition at all, they would be a lot happier because they can see a better world waiting for that's them. That's right. And that's what we need to do, Anthony. We need to, you know, we're being a positive impact on this world, not negative. So all of us together can make a difference. We've got to at least try. I mean, I'm seeing some a lot more victories from the beginning of this year coming through for these animals than I have many other year. So that's a big plus, you know, for the animals because – they don't need to be suffering and neglected and abused and, you know, tortured. They're, they're all on this earth temporary just like we are. And they need to live in peace and happiness and freedom, you know, comfort, respect, dignity. You know, so we got to do our part, everyone. So please, you know, visit. And, and thank you, Anthony, for everything you're doing. We're down to a couple minutes here. And, uh, you know, with even with our Earth, heal our planet Earth, everyone, that's important, too. I mean, all the topic he's got, visit his website, you know, freedomhorse.org, and check it out. And I'd like to have you on again, Anthony, um, speaking out for some more animals, you know, wildlife or whatever, dolphins, whales, whatever you want to discuss, you know. So we'll set up a, if it's okay with you, set up a date to bring them on because all lives matter including all the animals you know and if we don't do nothing nothing changes and you know all these i see all these groups the same groups and they're you know they're spread out everywhere and now and then they hardly have any activity going on so if they would just come together and work together as a team we we get a lot farther than what we're where we're at, you know. We get the team players out there, the the action takers, and, you know, and call your your state representatives. They're the big dogs, not us. We just come together to call the big dogs. But anyway, I want to Anthony. I want to thank you for coming on this evening, and I hope you have a great evening and and keep up the hard work that you're doing and outstanding work. And never give up hope. And everyone, I wanted to give a, a couple shout outs before I close down this evening. Uh for thanks for uh, thanks for sharing the show and supporting it since June four or June of twenty fourteen. Take action, help ban animal gas chambers, Megan Mason and Holly Smith. Uh Voices Care for uh animal support group. There's several admins in there to keep it going. The Paul's Call Show. I'm one of the admins on there also. Fans of animal rights, Arlene, thank you. And that's a huge page. Help fight the war against all animal cruelty today. Evelyn Pendle and Debbie Eisman, you guys are, are out there working hard. Thank you. Voices uh, for Animals on Facebook, one of the admins. A Voice for Animals on Twitter, Sean Walters. Paul's Pet Foundation, Sam Diaz. Thank you, Sam, a former guest. Uh, Diane Lynn Echo, a voice for all animals on Facebook, and we love uh, pit bulls on uh, uh, Blog Talk Radio. Thank you. The Pit Bull Advocate, uh, Dog Father, A.K. Pat Bowler. I mean, this list is huge, and all the pen interests and, and uh, Twitter followers, the LinkedIn, Facebook, all the pages I had men and groups. We're all a team out there. We can't, you know, we can't do it alone. We're better and stronger together than we are alone. So everyone, uh, next week, next Tuesday, or I'm sorry, Thursday at 7 o'clock Eastern will be Steve Hughes' Dogs in Danger. So I hope you tune in and keep uh, spreading the word about this show because, uh, you know, we, we are getting heard. I mean, can't take credit, but we are involved, so our voices do matter. These animals deserve the rights granted and not kicked to the curb or, or you know, ignored. So everybody have a, a nice evening. And thank you again, Anthony. And we're looking forward thank to you, having Debbie. you come thank back. You. You're awesome. Okay? Anytime. Yes. Anytime. Thank anytime. You. Thank, thank you. you.
Okay, and everybody, uh, hope to see you next or here, you know, tune in next week. And may God bless you all. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye, too. Bye-bye.